Shining every day, all along the way. There's a rainbow, there's a rainbow of perfect love. On the land and sea, shines for you and me. There's a rainbow, there's a rainbow of perfect love. There's a rainbow, a rainbow shining, rainbow of love. with golden lining, pointing to, it's always pointing, to heaven above, to heaven above. shining through, the clouds that gather, every cloud, in stormy weather, there's a rainbow, there's a rainbow of love, if your heart is sad, you would be made glad, there's a rainbow, there's a rainbow of perfect love, follow where it leads, there's a rainbow, there's a rainbow of perfect love. There's a rainbow, a rainbow shining, rainbow of love. with golden lining, pointing to, it's always pointing, to heaven above, to heaven above. shining through, the clouds that gather, every cloud, in stormy weather. There's a rainbow, there's a rainbow of perfect love. When we cross the tide on the other side, there's a rainbow, there's a rainbow of perfect love, shining on and on, round the great white throne. There's a rainbow, there's a rainbow of perfect love, there's a rainbow, a rainbow shining, rainbow of love, with golden lining, pointing to, it's always pointing, to heaven above, to heaven above. shining through, the clouds that gather, every cloud, in stormy weather. There's a rainbow, there's a rainbow of perfect love. Again, lesson 83, the mission return of the 70, uh, probably uh, after the uh, Feast of Tabernacles and entering into the uh, Feast of Dedication somewhere along that time frame. The Feast of Dedication, of course, is what uh, we think of as Hanukkah or what we know it as Hanukkah. Now, this takes place in Luke 10, 1 through 24. Jesus is down in the area of Judea. And we find that uh, as he had done in previous time, he had sent the 12 out two by two when they were in Galilee going around the coasts of Galilee and preaching to people, preparing the way for the coming kingdom. Now, as he is down in the areas of Judea, he sends 60 out instead of just the 12 with the intent that they speak about uh, the coming of the kingdom to prepare uh, various places for him uh, as he was to come preaching and teaching concerning the kingdom. And so we can see that he's kind of upping the ante in the area of Judea, preaching about the kingdom, the things of the kingdom. And we know, of course, from Acts, the first chapter, that the mission of the church would start in Jerusalem and then it would extend into Judea, and then Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so the area that Jesus is preparing here is the area of Judea closest to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was in the area of Judea. And so we're told that after the things that we were studying that took place in the uh, temple, uh, we're told that Jesus appointed 70 others. That is, he specifically chose 70 individuals uh, to send on this. Uh, originally, there was the 12. Now he chooses 70 to send out. So there will be 35 teams uh, in Galilee, there were six teams of two. And now there'll be uh, here 35 teams of individuals going about 
through Judea building upon events that has just taken place with the healing uh, of the blind man and some of the things that they saw, the miracles and discussions, to build the faith of those who were hearing, those who were kind of still in trying to sit on the fence line, uh, those who could be uh, moved over into the favor of Jesus. There are some very hard lines drawn. There are some who are trusting in Him and supporting Him. Uh, people like Mary and Lazarus and Martha uh, and others who are committed, at least 11 of the 12. We uh, don't know how dedicated Judas really was uh, to the whole process. But now there will be these who will go out two and two before his face in every city, place whether he himself was about to come. This will be, if you want to think of it, as advertisement. Uh, uh, it will be a proclamation. It will be a declaration that Jesus is in the process of coming to their city. Jesus is on His way. And as He is preparing to go, and as they are uh, going about, uh, they are bringing interest to that particular city to know, to look, to be prepared for the fact that Jesus was coming there. And He said unto them, The harvest indeed is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of harvest that He may send forth laborers into His harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, wallet, no shoes, and salute no man on the way. And into whatsoever house you shall enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon him. But if not, it shall return to you again. And in that same house remain, eating and drinking whatsoever things as they give. For the labor is worthy of his hire. And go not from house to house. And so there's not a lot of instructions uh, as I read this, and because time is uh, running relatively short, it seems to me that Jesus sent these teams out to these perhaps 35 cities to let them know that Jesus was coming and to establish a point or a place of reference as they came into the city where he knew that they would be uh, on what we might call his side or would be open to giving him hospitality. And so he sends them all out. They all come back in. Uh, and then it seems Jesus begins to make his trip. So it doesn't seem like they're going uh, these two teams are going through a lot of cities per se, but they're going into a city, they're preparing that city, and Jesus is going to come there later. And so I don't see Him as uh, following them because it's kind of what you think of as a shotgun effect. Uh, they're just going out in every direction. <laughs> Uh, 35 of them looking what appears to be uh, 35 places throughout Judea that uh, Jesus can visit and knows that while He's there, uh, He will be able to uh, find individuals who are interested in the things pertaining uh, to the kingdom of heaven. But he does warn them because there is division between the Jews as to 
whether Jesus is a false prophet, if he is possessed by a demon, if he is a sinner, there are those who have listened to the Jewish leaders and some have been convinced that Jesus is not someone that they really ought to be spending any time with. But on the other hand, there are these who believe that uh, He is perhaps the Messiah. And when the Messiah comes, what much more could He do than what this man does? And so He couldn't uh, be uh, doing the things that He did unless God was with Him. And so He tells them, uh, as you go out, I'm sending you out as lambs among the wolves. Uh, that uh, there is certain danger uh, that they need to be aware of. There are wolves. There are those who will not greet them. And he speaks about that here. He says when you, you come to a house and uh, he's going to give them uh, power. He's going to give them a limited amount of the Holy Spirit to work with. But it's interesting, he says, when you come to a house, when you approach that house and are ready to enter the house, say, peace be to this house, as if you're imparting through the Holy Spirit a blessing upon the house. But Jesus says, if there is a son of peace, if there is someone who is not a wolf, not uh, someone who might be uh, in opposition or to harm you, then that peace will remain there. It will settle upon the house. But if you go to a house and you say again, peace be to this house, and I don't really, we don't have much information about it, but he says, if that peace returns to you, you know, in essence, if it's, it's sort of like a blessing of the Holy Spirit is being imparted to that house. And if there is someone there that the Spirit knows as being God, he would know the hearts just like everyone else. And he would rest upon those that were there and it would settle there so that they might have a peaceful time. But if that bidding of peace comes back to them, uh, if it does not rest, then it's a warning to look for somewhere else. Uh, and so as you go into this house, if they're uh, willing uh, to receive you, if they're willing to show you hospitality, uh, then enter to that house and remain there. And we've talked about that concept before. It doesn't do any good for the uh, leadership to be in a city and you not be able to find them. And so Jesus says, stay, you know, when you offer peace and it rests on that house and they show you hospitality, enter into that house. And while you are there in that city, stay in that one place. That way, as people begin to talk about these two men, these two uh, people who have come from Jesus, uh, you know, they're at so-and-so's house. It will be a place where most people uh, would be familiar with uh, in the communities and things at that time. People tend to know one another. And so uh, they could find that house. And many times of the day, they might be out uh, talking with people. Uh, but in the evening, we see many times that people would go where Jesus was staying and there he would speak with them and teach with them. And so Jesus says, when you get there, uh, again, offer your peace. If the peace rests there, stay there while you're in the city preaching and teaching about the kingdom. And then he goes on to say, uh, eating and drinking such things as they give. 
and so for the labor is worthy of his hire. Uh, and so it seems as if, yes. Is this just to the household of Israel? Yes. To the, to the house, down into the, the area of Judea. Yeah, to, to the the people of Judea, the the Jews in this what uh, we would think of as Judea, where Judea was the tribe of Benjamin, uh, the the what used to be the old Southern Kingdom in the Old Testament. It seems that Jesus realizes, just as with him, uh, people who were excited about the opportunity to meet with Jesus and to work with His disciples, it seems Jesus is expecting that these individuals will show them good hospitality. You know, whatever it is that they have to offer. But Jesus, uh, in talking about the labor is worthy of His hire, uh, seems to imply the fact that, you know, they might be willing to say, you know, well, you know, you don't, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. That they might somehow create a, a problem with the hospitality. Whatever's offered, Jesus says, accept that. Um, and, you know, he speaks of them being worthy of the things that they are receiving. And, as he says here, he talks about the fact that they weren't take, to take a purse and uh, they weren't to take a money bag, wallet, those things with them. Uh, much like the original one, they were to travel light and they were to be dependent upon uh, those who showed them hospitality. And by them traveling light, uh, there might actually be someone who would be willing to give them things, uh, not just as far as food, but there might be offerings that, uh, and gee, your your coat looks uh, a little worn. Uh, here, we what, I would like to give you this. And so between the food and there might be gifts and other things, whatever they present to you, whatever they give to you, accept that. You know, accept it graciously. Uh, and he tells them that they are worthy. You know, sometimes they may not feel that, uh, you know, that attention should be placed on them. It should rather be pointed toward Jesus. But Jesus says that uh, you, as a laborer in the vineyard, are worthy uh, of your hire. Uh, you know, we have, uh, and I have in times past run into uh, people in the church that believe that a preacher shouldn't be paid. You know, and again, uh, you know, it's, it's not being said because I need money, but again, I, I do need money, but uh, there are those who believe that somehow a preacher ought to preach and he shouldn't get paid anything for it. Well, you, you know, you, if that's the case, and if you're going to have to make your own living, that cuts down the amount of time that you have uh, to give to the service of God. But nonetheless, there are congregations of the Lord's church uh, that don't pay their preachers anything. You ought to preach here. Uh, and, and some of them uh, don't have a regular preacher because... If they had a regular preacher, if they appointed a regular preacher, uh, they would he'd probably expect to get paid. And so they invite somebody different every week to come and preach. Uh, that way, you know, they don't have to pay them other than maybe some gasoline or something or invite them home to dinner. Um, you know, and, and Jesus says that uh, again, you know, whatever these people offer you, uh, you should accept it. If it's good food, better food than you expect, go ahead and eat it. Uh, if they offer you uh, an, an outer garment, if they offer you a garment, if they offer you things, uh, accept that. Uh, and the early church uh, was based on those same kind of 
precepts that people gave to the apostles and they distributed as people had need. And they went about uh, preaching and teaching the king about the kingdom and the church after uh, it was established. And so again, go not house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such as set before you. Heal the sick that are therein. Say to them, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Part of what uh, the Hebrew writer tells us that the word that was first spoken by the Lord and then by those who heard Him was confirmed by signs, wonders, and miracles which they performed. And so as Jesus had been doing miracles, as He had healed the blind man, uh, and that <clears throat> caused people to say, you know, how could someone open the eyes of the blind and be evil? It just doesn't make any sense. And so as these individuals came representing Jesus, telling them that He was coming, uh, preaching and teaching that the kingdom of heaven is is coming near, and and we're about six months or less at this time, and so the kingdom of heaven is coming ever closer uh, to a reality. And in order for them to believe the things that they were saying, uh, the spirit, or at least a portion of the spirit, not maybe to the same extent that they received on the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> but they did have the ability to heal the sick. And so when people heard that disciples of Jesus were there in the city talking about Jesus coming, um, people would begin to gather up their sick and they would wait and be looking for Jesus to come. And even before Jesus shows up, the disciples are going to be healing them. And this is a way of confirming the Word which was being taught. Any questions or comments down through there? But into whatsoever city ye enter and they receive you not, Go out into the streets thereof and say, even the dust from your city that cleaveth to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh. And so the possibility did exist that there were cities, that there were pockets. And remember, in many of these cities, the larger ones, they would have a synagogue and so there would be a rabbi there and there would be religious leaders in that city and they may have been of the party or of agreement with the religious leaders at Jerusalem and siding with them <clears throat> and they might not want anything and they may have put pressure on them to not, you know, these men have come here and they've came here from Jesus they may have literally told the people of the city, don't let them into your house. Uh, don't let them into your house. Don't offer them anything to eat. Don't show them hospitality. Uh, you know, just stay away from them. And that's the way John speaks in 2 John 9. If someone comes to you and, and brings not this doctrine, don't receive him into your house, neither bid him God speed, or else you end up being a partaker of his evil deeds. Well, in this particular case, Jesus says that works in the opposite direction also, that you may go into a city and because of what you're saying and what you're teaching and what you represent, or more accurately, who you represent, they may not be willing to receive you, show you any hospitality, and so it's interesting, Jesus says for them to stand in the middle of the street uh, and to make this proclamation that they're not even going to be taking the dust of this town uh, on that cleaves to their shoes with them, but still remind them that the kingdom of heaven is nigh. 
seems seem like he was a little skittish and he told him two or three different times, you know, not to be afraid that he'd give them the power to tread over scorpions and everything to overcome them, you know. Well, still when you have somebody up in your face screaming, yelling, spitting. Yeah. yeah. Gets 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 a little scary, you know. It's hard you know, it's you know what's you've been told, but you know, when somebody's up in your face and screaming and yelling and and uh, you can smell what they had for lunch on their breath, they're that close, it gets a little scary sometimes. But Jesus says that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than that city. And of course, we know what the end result of Sodom was. Uh, Woe unto thee, Cherizim, and to Bethesda, Bethsaida, sorry. For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which had been done in you, they'd have long ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. And of course, Tyre and Sidon were some city that were not necessarily uh, countries of the Jews, but they were associated with the Jews, and Tyre and Sidon was on the uh, west coast, or the east coast of the Mediterranean, but the west side of uh, the Holy Land. And so it's apparent that there wasn't a great deal of positive response uh, you know, and Capernaum shall, uh, even though they should be exalted into heaven, be brought down into Hades. And Jesus says, He that heareth you heareth me, he that rejecteth you rejecteth me, and he that rejecteth me rejecteth him that sent me. One of the things, whether it's today or whether it's then, Sometimes we tend to take things personally when we talk to people about the church and they get upset about it, or, uh, you know, and we want to take it personally as if it's a personal attack on us. Now, obviously, they're standing right there, and Jesus sent these people, and if they're standing in front of somebody, you know, that person's angry, that person is inhospitable toward them but Jesus says you know don't let you know that get the best of you you know if they reject the things that you're saying they're they're not just rejecting you but they're rejecting me because I'm the one that sent you and if they in turn reject you and therefore reject me they also reject him that sent me and of course that's the father and so we're back to that basic message of the gospel that we're supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. And, and the point is, if they hear us, if they believe us, and they obey the gospel, good, wonderful, they, they're saved, but if they don't believe what we're saying, and if they don't do that, they're not just rejecting us. So many people in a church you feel that I must make people believe. I must make people uh, obey the gospel. It's like the pressure's on my shoulders. I'm the one that has to make them do this. Jesus didn't say anything about making people do anything. He just tells us to go and teach and preach and proclaim. And it's up to them. If they obey, if they believe and, and obey the gospel, then good. And if not, it's not against you. It doesn't take anything away from you, but you know, it's it's their soul that's in jeopardy. He said if they, if they reject you, just wipe your feet and go to the next house. Yeah. I mean, that's you made them an offer. You know, you made them an offer uh, of the gospel, but they're not willing to uh, accept it. Uh, so just move on. 
you know, we don't ever really want to fully give up on anybody. You know, the old saying is, as long as there's breath, there's hope. But if we get focused on one individual who's a very stubborn individual, and we focus all of our time on that individual, we miss the opportunity to speak with others who are perhaps more open to the things of the church. And so you can't let two or three people uh, become something that you commit yourself fully to at the expense of everybody else. And so Jesus says, go and tell them. You know, give them the opportunity. But if they're not interested, move on. You know, maybe we'll come back have, if we have an opportunity and, and we'll address this again with them at a later time, but move on. There's other people out there who still haven't heard. There's other people out there who will accept. And so sometimes you just have to move on. And that's what Jesus said. You come to a house and you say, peace be to you. And the Holy Spirit sort of shakes His head and said, not going to happen here. Jesus said, then move on. You know, then move on to, to the next house. And if they reject you, they're not just rejecting the things that you're saying. Remember, they're rejecting me and rejecting me. They're rejecting Him that sent me. <clears throat> and so they went out with that charter. They went out uh, the 35 teams to find a city, to stay there, to preach, heal the sick, let them know that the kingdom of heaven was literally at hand. The kingdom of heaven was not far. And we're just talking about a matter of months. And if we're somewhere around what uh, we speak of as Hanukkah, if we're that far, the next holy day, the next special observance that the children of Israel will be having is Passover. And what happens on Passover? Jesus is crucified. And so there, there is this time and the next time that all the people of God are assembled back together in Jerusalem for the Passover and observing the Passover even in other places, that's when Jesus is going to the cross. So the kingdom of heaven really is nigh at hand. <clears throat> and so they go out as Jesus has charged them. And then we don't have a lot about, and actually don't have anything here about really what was going on at that time other than uh, the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us in Thy name. And so that tells me that there, was, uh, there may have been some bad days and there may have been some glitches along the way, but each of them, the 70 returned, they had found a place uh, that the peace of God would rest upon and that they could teach about the kingdom, they could heal the sick, and they had the power to, uh, to uh, cast out demons. And they came back filled with joy because you know, to them it was a very successful trip. They had preached the good news of the coming of the kingdom, they had healed the sick. They'd even cast out demons and they were all excited about the fact that they were able to cast out demons. But Jesus makes a, a comment to them and He says, I beheld Satan fallen as lightning from heaven. Uh, behold, I have given to you authority to tread upon serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall in any wise hurt you. Uh, there is two different ways of interpreting verse 18. Some say verse 18 is a warning to the disciples not to be filled with pride 
Don't become prideful that the demons are now subject to you. Don't get all puffed up at this. Uh, and when he says he beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven, uh, that is a warning of the demise of the devil because of his pride and prideful nature that he rebelled against God. And in the qualifications for an elder in 1 Timothy 3, one of the qualifications of an elder is that he should not be a novice, that is a new Christian, lest being lifted up by pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And so uh, Jesus here perhaps tells them that uh, you know you, you need to kind of temper that just a little bit. Don't let it, I mean, it's, it's a good thing, but don't let it go to your head. But then others say in an in interpretation of this, that he is making a comment about the influence or the power that they had as they went out, as they preached to these people he saw, uh, in essence, whether literally or in a spiritual framework, he saw that the foundations of Satan, in essence, were, were crumbling because people were uh, turning to the things of the gospel. This scripture here, verse 19, is an important one because when we get over to Mark 16, a lot of people there talk about, you know, they'll take up serpents and, and if they drink any deadly thing and all this, they take that literally. But here Jesus uses this phrase about giving them power upon serpents and scorpions uh, he's, he's not saying that they ought to be snake handlers or they ought to be out taking scorpions as pets. But he's talking about the powers of evil. He speaks of the powers of evil as serpents and scorpions, those that we think of as, as enemies. And all the power here of the enemy and nothing in any wise shall hurt you if they drink any a deadly thing, it, it won't hurt them. These are the, is a parallel passage to what Jesus says when he says, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. And in my name they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, and so it's the exact same thing. He gave them a charter. They went out and they did it. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time and study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.